This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 94. Welcome to the 94th episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I started this podcast because I believe that every woman has the right to know exactly how her body and her fertility works. I'm here to connect you with the tools and information that you need to improve your menstrual cycle health and fertility, and I feel so privileged to be able to share my passion for body literacy and fertility awareness with you every single week. Fertility awareness is so much more than just birth control or trying to get pregnant because it truly gives you a window into your own health and fertility, and I love sharing my expertise with my clients and helping them to understand their charts and connect with their cycles. If you've recently discovered fertility awareness but you're not feeling confident about using it for birth control just yet, or if you've been charting for a while and you're having trouble making sense of what's happening in your cycle, I can help. Get started today with a free 15-minute consultation with me by heading over to fertilityfriday.com coaching or just click the work with me button on my website. And I would also like to invite you to sign up for the Fertility Friday newsletter. Head over to fertilityfriday.com ebook and as a gift to you, you'll receive a free copy of my new ebook where I reveal what to expect when coming off of hormonal contraceptives and I share five steps to restoring healthy menstrual cycles post pill. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Lear Keith, to the show. Lear is a writer, small farmer, and radical feminist activist. She is the author of six books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food Justice, and Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation, which I'm excited to delve into a bit in our conversation today. And she is also a co-author with Derek Jensen and Eric McBeigh of Deep Green Resistance, Strategy to Save the Planet. And I love how you included in your uh, bio, Lier, that you've also been arrested six times. So, <laughs> so I'm going to have to ask you about that too. <laughs> uh, and in today's show, we'll be delving into the topic of veganism and vegetarianism and the impact it can have on fertility. Um, and we're also going to tackle the idea that veganism is the ticket to saving the world. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Lier. Well, thanks for having me on, Lisa. Well, thanks so much for being here. So uh, I'd love for you to, you know, introduce yourself, uh, although I read your bio, tell the listeners a little bit about just kind of what brought you to where you're at today and in what you do. But I also want to hear about the arrest thing. <laughs> so I, um, I was a vegan for 20 years. I started when I was 16. Um, and like most people who become vegetarian or vegan, I did it because I met somebody else who was already a vegan. Um, so I had a, a young friend and, you know, that I knew from high school and whatnot, um, and her family, were, they were vegans. And uh, within two weeks of talking to her, I was utterly convinced that I had to do this, that I was going to save animals and save the planet and save people and save my health all in one neat little pack package by simply refraining from eating animal products. And I was 16 years old and very idealistic, very impassioned about all the injustices that I saw in the world. And, you know, if you don't have counter information, um, what the vegans tell you makes sense. And I did not have any counter information. I didn't have the first idea where my food came from or what the cost of it might be. So um, all of it made sense. And you see those horrible pictures of animals being tortured in factory farms. And I wanted nothing to do with that. Once I knew about it, there, I couldn't go back. So I did it. So for 20 years, that was what I ate. And I year by year destroyed my health. And some of that is permanent because I did it for so long. So in many ways, my life story is a cautionary tale for other young people who think that this is the way forward. Um, so, you know, on the day that you stop doing it, of course, your life completely collapses. You have no idea where you belong <laughs> in the universe, in your social world. Um, your relationship to everything just falls apart. It's a very hard day. Um, so I had to find out new information. I had to figure out why did this fail and what exactly was correct about this and what was wrong about it. Um, and so I always try to start by saying that the values that underlie that impulse, the vegetarian ethic, the, the, you know, the vegan ethic, that's not the problem, right? So those, those values like justice and compassion and sustainability, those are the only values that are going to get us to the world that we need. So that's not the problem. The problem is information. So it's, um, you know, how, how best to institute those values 
um, to change the world toward the world that we all want. Um, and with enough information, I, you know, ended up having to make a very different decision than the one that I made for those 20 years. Um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, what happened to me. I mean, I, if you want more details about what exactly went wrong, I'm happy to give you those, you know, gory details, but, um, uh, you know, enough to say that it, it's absolutely permanent for some of us that we did it too long. Um, we were, you know, much too, uh, you know, it, we, it's fun. It can be a very fundamentalist mindset and it's hard to get out of once you get into it. So, um, it's definitely a cautionary tale. Well, I can definitely echo just how just convincing and profound and just the way that the arguments are, you know, Yeah. and I've said this on the podcast before that I too dabbled in veganism. And as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I guess I was one of the lucky ones in the sense that my body just completely rejected <laughs> <laughs> it, it rejected it. I couldn't continue. Um, that I had a number of, of challenges uh, just like immediately. And there were certain things that just didn't match up. So, you know, I was reading a bunch of stuff that would talk about how, um, you know, truly plant-based diets were more satisfying for a number of reasons. And, um, you know, regardless of how much I read that, I was always hungry. <laughs> Right, <laughs> And it didn't matter how much vegetables and different soy products that I ate, it didn't, it just was not filling the void. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I would ask you, is it, is there something to the bio-individuality piece? Is there a reason why some people do a lot better or at least seem to do better on a vegan diet than others? Um, I think some people have more bounce, you know, they just have a stronger constitution and their bodies can take abuse longer. Um, some of us can take abuse a lot less longer. Um, and some of us can take abuse less longer, but we are so ideologically bound that we will just keep going even when we've ground ourselves into the dirt. And I would be in that last category. I mean, I did start to fall apart pretty quickly on this diet. I mean, by the time I'd done it two years, out of 20. So year two, I had already destroyed my spine, stopped menstruating. Uh, my skin was so dry, it hurt and kept me up at night. Um, I was severely hypoglycemic. I had terrible depression, anxiety all the time. So exhausted, I could barely stand up. And I continued for another 18 years. So, you know, like, how long can ideology keep you alive? And for some of us, scarily enough, uh, the answer was quite a while. Um, because we're true believers, and we're fanatics, and you know, on the good side of fanatics, we are the people who change the world. But on the bad side, uh, we can do terrible things to ourselves and each other. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, but in terms of that kind of, you know, individuality, bio-individuality, you know, we are one species. And the, the template of nutrition for the human race, we know what human beings need. And that's true for every species. Like, there aren't some rabbits that eat grass and other rabbits that eat seafood. Like, we know what rabbits eat. And they have a certain digestive system and they have certain nutritional needs that have to be met. And it's the same for humans. I mean, it, we've got this pretty well clocked out at this point. We know what human beings need to eat. And that those, those nutritional needs are not met um, by eating a plant-based diet. There are too many things that are only available in animal products um, to say that, that people can really thrive on that diet. You can stumble along. You know, and if you had a, you know, if you come from a, a good, a, a, you know, an ancestry of good, strong constitutions and you had some good nutrition as a kid, you may be able to string this along for longer. But eventually, you know, you are you are on drawdown the whole time. You're on nutritional drawdown. Um, and eventually the rubber hits the road. Well, one of my most contentious posts on my website um is six ways that a, a vegan diet could harm your fertility. And if, if anyone, I'll link it to the show notes. And if anyone wants to go to that article and take a read, if you actually start reading through the comments, you'll see like a fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, right. it's really interesting. But basically, when I talk about different nutrients that are required, especially because I'm, I'm coming from a perspective of fertility. And, you know, being a, a, a mother, a young a mother of a young family. Um, I have a son who is turning one next week and then another son who's um, three and a half. But 
having gone through that process, you really see that what you eat, it's that literal, very literal, like you are what you eat. So what you yeah. eat makes your children. <laughs> sure. And so you need to have certain nutrient nu- nutrients in order for that to happen. But even with all of that, it's kind of like people think they can outthink what their body needs. Um, maybe you could just talk about that because I find it really interesting that this it's an ideologically driven diet and you kind of you mentioned it's like fundamentalist idea and it is um but why is it that we think that we can outthink what our body needs i think there's a few things going on one is that especially in places like the united states and canada where so many of us are from immigrant backgrounds obviously not everybody there are people who have been living here for 10,000 years but you know my family's all from Europe ultimately and it's a lot of different parts of Europe and they all you know kind of come together here and created me but we don't have one food culture and i think that that's kind of key that whatever you know my ancestors knew about traditional food and what kept people healthy from generation to generation got lost You know, it got lost when they came to America and settled here and gave up what it meant to be, you know, those ethnic backgrounds. That cultural stuff just got abandoned so that they could assimilate to America. So that's one problem. Um, Another problem is that, you know, the 1950s came along and there was this whole push to eat modern food. You know, and this was food that was super clean and produced in a factory and involved no work, you know, once it got to your kitchen. And it came in cans and it came in little frozen packages and it, you know, came out of a factory. And that was the good way. That was the modern way. That meant you were an American. And so all these, especially recent immigrants, um, you know, were told very strongly, you know, by these cultural messages, these images, especially through television, that if you were going to be a modern assimilated American with a bright, shiny future, this was what you ate. So you gave up all that traditional stuff because it smelled bad and it was weird and nobody would like you and you weren't be, we wouldn't be a real American. So it got broken, you know, that, that, that ancestral link about what keeps us healthy. All that food was taken from us. All the knowledge about that food was taken from us very specifically, you know, by corporate America to sell us, you know, really bad food, essentially. Um, but it made them a lot of money. So what, what did they care as long as they make their profits? So that's another big part of it. Um, you know, if you visit other places around the world that still have strong food cultures, um, it's amazing what people know about nutrition. Um, even if they don't have the actual words for it, you know, like they don't know the vitamin D content or something really specific, uh, they know that you have to eat certain things to stay healthy. And they think you're kind of crazy to try anything else. And they're generally right. You know, like I have a friend who's, you know, whose who's background is Pakistani and all the women in her family and her extended family know exactly what kind of broth to make for what kind of condition. So when you're pregnant, you eat this broth. After the baby's born, you eat this broth. When the baby is two years old, you feed it this broth. And all the broths are a little bit different. And they've probably never been analyzed in a lab because who cares about women's knowledge and healthy babies? But these women have been doing this for thousands of years. And you know if they put that food through a lab, they would find something. I can guarantee you there is something different about each one of those bras <laughs> that over thousands of years, women have figured out this is how you have a ha- healthy pregnancy, a healthy mom, a healthy baby. Like, I have no doubt at all that there is something true about what they're doing with that broth. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, you know, I don't have. You know, it got lost in my culture. You know, so here I am trying to figure it out as a teenager. And I, you know, I just didn't know. And I didn't live on a farm. And I had not a clue where anything came from. Um I will say that my mother was very upset when I became a vegan. Like she knew that milk and butter were important. Couldn't say why, but she knew that they were. And um, I mean, she was so, so upset. She cried herself to sleep at night because she's like, you're going to destroy yourself. Turns mm-hmm. out she was right. <laughs> Just on that mother's instinct level, she was absolutely right. Um But yeah, I think that that's one of the reasons we just, we don't know what healthy food is or where it comes from or why. So we're cut adrift, all of us. And so I think we're very, um, we're, we're easily preyed upon by other ideologies that take precedence over what would be common sense in a, a culture that had its own integrity still. Um, and so I think that that makes us very vulnerable. I really, what you said there really resonates with me because I, I can speak of a similar experience. Just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite close to my, my own culture and heritage. My parents are from the West Indies, but I don't live in the West Indies. And I even find sometimes in conversations with my mother, even about child rearing or, you know, 
eating or whatever, she almost takes for granted that I would know kind of the traditional way to do things. Mm -hmm. But I I wouldn't because I I didn't grow up there. And so what you said about not necessarily having that connection to kind of your the the ancestral roots and not just your parents and your grandparents but if you were still living in the place where your ancestors were living and you had generations upon generations upon generations of this tradition these traditions and history and those types of things it it is hugely different it yeah it's hugely different and so I, I think that that's huge and I really I'm really glad that you brought that up well, I actually have an interesting story. It's a little bit of an anecdote, but I think you will appreciate this. So my father and my grandparents um, were refugees in World War II, and they had to flee. They were, my dad was born in Latvia, and they had to flee um, after the Soviet invasion. And they ended up um, in Germany, which, believe it or not, over a million people actually immigrated to Germany during the Nazi era because they had more or less open borders. So they took in this huge number of refugees. So now they're living in Germany in refugee camps, and they're you know half starved. They've got bombs falling on them from all, right and left. How they survived some of these experiences is just, I don't have a clue. But they did. Um, And so at one point, um, they ended up having to flee the refugee camp where they were. And my, because of other bizarre reasons, my grandfather actually had a small pile of gold in his pocket still. The Russian ruble was actually universal currency across Europe. It was accepted for, you know, a few centuries, actually, because it was made, it was very well made and everybody knew it was exactly an ounce. So he still had some that he'd never converted to either Latvian or German currency. And um, now it's wartime. And so gold becomes the standard again. So he was able to buy them enough petrol on the black market to get them out of the refugee camp with that last little bit of gold. So now they drive and they drive and they drive. You could get cars apparently really easily, which you couldn't get was the gas. And that was what they were able to buy with that little bit of gold that he had left. So they buy the gas and they drive and they drive as far away as they can to whatever safety they can find and they end up way in the mountains of Bavaria and they basically ran out of gas and like well here we are and at this point my grandmother is seven months pregnant with my uncle Andy so she's and she's so pregnant but also just I mean they're starving there's just no food so they arrive in this little tiny village. They don't know what to do. They, you know, they speak a little bit of the language, but hardly any. And it's a farming community. And they're like, as long as you're willing to work, we'll give you a place to live. So they do. They take them in. And when the women see my grandmother's pregnant, they're actually just incredibly kind and loving to her. And they're like, we're going to help you. Don't worry. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get we'll get everything together you need for a baby. And they start donating clothes and, you know, the way that women can take care of each other. Mm-hmm. So they do this for my grandmother. So uh, my uncle is born. And this is the amazing part. My grandmother is so just starved of nutrients that she doesn't even breastfeed. There's no milk. She doesn't lactate. Um, But the women know what to do. And again, this is this like ancestral wisdom. They know that the best milk, if you can't breastfeed, the next best thing for a baby is raw goat milk. And this is true. Goat milk is actually a lot easier for infants to digest than cow milk. Because both were available in this little farming community. So my dad at that point is, I don't know, was he maybe 10 years old? His job was to go down the street every day to, um, down the little road to a goat farm. And they were able to get raw goat milk every day for my Uncle Andy. And that was his first food. Um, And then after that, of course, I mean, up in the German mountains, what they're eating is sausages. That's what German (laughs) cuisine is famous for. But you know, it's made from actual organ meats and actual blood. So here's this child born from a mother who's so starved she can't even lactate. I will tell you my Uncle Andy is six foot two and has the most gorgeous teeth you've ever seen. And this is because they were able to repair that nutritional deficit by giving him these really just incredibly dense, nutrient-dense, traditional animal foods. And they knew what to do for him. Like That's they knew, amazing. you know, and I'm just, when I heard this story later, I mean, I heard bits of the story as a kid. I didn't know how to, you know, it didn't make as much sense to me, but as an adult with all this information, you know, from the Western Price Foundation and my own experiences, and I'm looking back at my father and my, you know, my grandparents' lives. And I was like, oh my God, that story about, you know, the mountains and that farming community, those women knew exactly what to do for my grandmother. Mm-hmm. And it worked. I mean, I'm telling you, the guy is huge and gorgeous skeleton like they they repaired that template so that by the time his teeth came in it was all fixed you know he had enough calcium he had enough vitamin a and vitamin d and he's fine i mean he's absolutely gorgeous so you know it works Mm -hmm. and they knew what to do so there's my little anecdote 
Well, I love that. It it reminds me too, because it's interesting, like you said, when you hear stories as a kid, you kind of pick up on certain parts of it. But then when you're an adult, you kind of get the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, a little anecdote coming from my family, and it kind of connects. So it kind of, it, there's a reason why when I learn about the Weston Price Foundation, uh, it really resonates with me. So, you know, my dad, I didn't even realize, he, he, I know he always likes to eat the weird stuff. And when I was a kid, he'd always <laughs> like put fish eyes in my face and all that kind of right. stuff. But, um, and he would always talk like lovingly about how he would eat when he was growing up, like mm-hmm. brain and yeah, that's the, right. the, the yeah. heart and the liver and the lungs and all that kind of stuff of the animals. And so my, my great uncle had a slaughterhouse and that's, what they did for a living and he always would talk about how he would wake up early in the morning and milk the cows and you know all that kind of stuff so my dad was fully raised on a western price diet and he's the healthiest man you've ever met he's got an amazing constitution of course he has all his wisdoms and he just he's he's rarely if ever sick and so i think it's just so (laughs) exactly and so i'm i feel fortunate in my case that it's it's only one generation away Right. Um, but it kind of took me throwing, going through that um, interesting vegan phase to figure it out. So one of the things that I found really interesting too, kind of going through that experience of trying to be vegan was that it kind of felt like a game, like a board game almost, because you're trying to like read and figure out how much protein is in what vegetable yeah, to right. make sure you're <laughs> getting enough. And then you're trying to eat soy products. And then what, so what happened with me is that I, I, I realized again because I already knew this, but I had to realize it again, that I can't really eat soy products at all because it just destroys me and I have a thyroid issue. And so I, the soy, so then I take out the soy and I'm like, there's nothing to eat except beans, you know, and it's just, anyways. So that was my experience. So I want to hear a little bit more about your experience um, and to kind of get a little bit deeper into what happened because you mentioned that you had permanent damage from Mm -hmm. a lack of nutrition and so um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that looked like for you and why that happened. Right. So let's see. Uh, probably the worst thing is I have my spine's degenerating. I have degenerative disc disease. And at this point, it's four levels of my spine. And for the real medical nerds out there, I have a grade four derangement at four levels of my spine. So it's as bad as it gets. I mean, I'm lucky I can stand up at all. Um, and I will be in morphine level pain for the rest of my life. So I destroyed my spine and it's quite clear, you know, reading much later when you come out of this and you're trying to figure out what I did, um, you know, the kinds of nutrients you need to have a strong skeletal system with good, healthy joints are simply not available in a vegan diet. So, you know, we talk about traditional peoples who achieve that kind of perfect health and they have, you know, anywhere from, you know, like 10 to 100 times as many minerals as we eat now. Um, and on a vegan diet, there's just really none. Um, it's, you know, that the best source of minerals are bones. Um, so you're either eating the bones themselves or you're eating bone broth that is, you know, simmered for 24, 48 hours. That's just a traditional food around the world is bone broth. And, you know, you certainly aren't eating that as a vegan. So all of those minerals, you know, are just not available to you. They just, they just don't exist in, in plant foods the way that they do in animal foods. Um, and then you have things like vitamin A and vitamin D, which are really needed for keeping bones and joints healthy. Again, those are only available in animal fats, and I wasn't eating any. And then you come to the soy problem. Um, and so it will back up a little bit. Um, one of the problems with eating things like grains and beans is that they are seeds, okay? And plants don't actually want to be eaten either. They have a number of ways to hurt animals so that we don't eat them. Um, and what they use to fight back with are chemicals. So they are nature's chemical warfare experts. And they've been working on this for a few billion years, and they know how to keep us from eating them. They make themselves toxic t- to us in all kinds of ways. Um, and especially true for their seeds, because their seeds are their babies. That's the future of the species. So seeds are actually really hard to digest. And that's the reason, is because plants don't want us to eat their babies. One of the things that plants those plants give their babies um, are a whole bunch of anti-nutrients, but there's particularly something called phytic acid, which is um, in seeds. And when the plant starts to actually sprout, um, those phytates, or the phytic acid, is is um, 
the, the plant has a way to kind of disable it so that, uh, you know, it's, it stops being there and then the plant can grow. Um, but you have to, if you're going to eat those kinds of things, you have to trick the plant, trick the seeds into thinking that, um, hey, it's time to sprout. So this is why, you know, people who do eat various seeds around the world tend to have these sort of lengthier processes of you know, tricking the seeds, of sprouting and soaking and fermenting. All of that is a way it's, is to get some of those nutrients to make them more bioavailable uh, by telling the seed, yes, you can sprout now, you can disable your phytates, you're not going to be eaten. It's a lie because then you do eat them, but you know, you're, you, the people have figured out ways around this to some extent. Um, but the problem with soy is that no matter how much you do that, no matter how long you ferment that soy, it's so high in, the, in, the, in those phytates that um, it, they're always going to be there. So one of the things that the phytates do as you're eating them is um, they lock onto minerals in your digestive tract so that they're not available to you anymore. You just, they're just taken right out of your system again. So if you're eating soy, that's what you're doing. And every time you eat a meal that has soy in it, you're actually losing minerals from your body. Um, so every time you eat, some amount, particularly of calcium but also zinc, um, is needed to actually digest um, so you're borrowing it from your body in the, in the promise that the food that you eat will put it back. And the problem with soy especially is that you never get to put it back. Um, so it's quite clear what I did to my joints. Um, eating soy will do that. You know, you will. You will. It's just that's just the nature of soy. Um, and even if I had known how to do those kinds of traditional practices um, in terms of fermentation and whatnot, the soy is just impossible. You, you'll never get rid of all of it. And soy is particularly good at blocking zinc. And zinc is especially needed for healthy joint cartilage. So all of this suddenly made sense as I was reading about it, trying to figure out, you know, why did my spine fall apart at age 18? This is not normal. Um, I suddenly realized, oh, it's the soy, it's the zinc. Okay, this, now you see the domino effect of what I did. Um, one thing I will say is that when I gave up being a vegan and I learned these bitter principles about food and how to get grass-based meat and dairy products, um, I did get a minor miracle in that my spine is dramatically better than it was. By the time I was done being a vegan, I really could not stand up for more than about three minutes at a time. In fact, I couldn't even sit up for more than about 20 minutes. Um, and over the course of maybe four or five years of eating you know, more appropriate human diet, um, I got dramatically better. I will always be in pain. I will never be able to stand up for more than 30 minutes. But trust me, being able to sit up for eight hours is a very different life than only being able to sit up for 20 minutes. So I did was able to reclaim my health to the extent that it could be. But this is permanent. And this is really why I want especially that sort of next generation of idealistic young people to try to listen to the stories like mine because we trashed ourselves for no good reason. And we understand what we did now. People like me, people like you, Lisa, you know, we, we found the knowledge that explained what happened to us and why it didn't work. And we will explain it to you, young people, if you want to hear why this isn't going to work long term. We can tell you what we did and where it goes wrong. So in terms of your joints, these are the problems you're going to have. And I have met just countless people now with the same story, vegetarians and vegans, who wrecked the, you know, their knees, their hips, their spines. Some of them ended up with the exact same condition I have. Um, and we all know why. So that's the spine piece. The another thing I ended up with was Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. And um, again, the soy actually plays a very big role in that. Soy is so hard on your thyroid. And there's no question, the more soy I ate, the worse my autoimmune disease got. Another big one for autoimmune diseases of all kinds is, of course, gluten. And this is because if you look at the, you know, amino acids are what make up proteins. And there's strings of amino acids that arrange themselves sort of in different patterns to make different physical structures. Um, and gluten, you know, it's, that's the protein of wheat, and it has a specific pattern of amino acids. And one of the big problems with gluten is that that pattern matches a number of different tissues in the human body. So this is why gluten is sort of overrepresented in creating a lot of autoimmune conditions. So in my case, it's the TPO antibodies um, are high because the TPO is this enzyme that your thyroid creates, and that looks a lot like some of the gluten proteins. So you feed your body gluten, your autoimmune, your immune system says, oh, that's an invader, I have to attack it. The problem with your immune system is that it's really good at recognizing faces. Once it's met a stranger and it thinks that's an enemy, it will recognize it in other places. So 
all of a sudden that little string of proteins, it recognizes the face and says, oh, look, it's just like this enzyme in your thyroid. We have to attack that too. That must be an invader as well. So that's what's happened to my thyroid is, you know, this autoimmune reaction now because it looks so much like gluten protein. And you could say the same for your joints. You know, you could go through the body all the ways that these little strings of proteins look very much like gluten. And that's the problem. Um, so if you have an autoimmune disease, I highly recommend going gluten-free. It's actually pretty key to anyone's recovery. It was a miracle for me going gluten-free. made a huge difference. One of the only things that's really helped me with the autoimmune condition. Um, but having an autoimmune disease is no fun. And having the thyroid one is no fun because you're exhausted and you're freezing cold and your hair is dry and, you know, you can't get enough sleep no matter what you do and all that fun stuff. So, um, and it's permanent and... You know, if you have one autoimmune disease, you're 40% likely to get another one. People die from autoimmune diseases. It's pretty serious stuff. And autoimmune diseases are, uh, those conditions are part of what's known as this constellation of problems that we've named the diseases of civilization. Um, and you know, the other side of that, of course, is that there are no corresponding diseases of hunter-gatherers. <laughs> the problem is civilization, and the foods of civilization are agricultural foods. So when people take up agriculture around the world, um, this is what happens. They get cardiovascular disease. They get diabetes. They get cancer. It's a big one. And they also get autoimmune diseases. And these are not conditions that are seen in hunter-gatherers. It's a very, very strict dividing line. Uh, between agriculturalists and, and the hunters of the world. Um, and it's, you know, gluten is one of the main reasons. So, um, yeah, so the disease of civilization. So I've got a bunch of those. So I had that, I had that. Um, I also got, um, after maybe, I don't know, 18 months of being a vegan, I pretty much stopped menstruating. Um, and that went on my whole time that I was a vegan. I just almost never got a period. Nobody could tell me why. That seems absurd now. You know, you're a young woman and you go to a doctor and you say, I'm not menstruating. You would think they would at least say, well, gosh, what are you eating? And they don't know to even ask. These are doctors and they don't even understand the basics of nutrition. So I will tell you one really basic thing. And that is that cholesterol is the mother hormone. You cannot make other hormones without cholesterol. That's the building block of all your hormones, especially your sex hormones. So without cholesterol, you don't have estrogen, you don't have testosterone, you don't have progesterone, you don't have that whole constellation of hormones that you need to be a fertile woman or a fertile man. They need these hormones as well. Um, your fertility has gone. You just can't make it. Whatever tiny bits of cholesterol you might be having now and again because you, quote, cheat on your vegan diet are going to go to keep you alive. Your body will preferentially keep you alive rather than keep you fertile. So you know, it'll use those for really basic biological functions and you just won't be fertile. So in my case, yeah, I could not have produced a baby if the human race depended on it. And this is the part you can believe me or not, but I found out all this information about soy and I read all the Western price stuff and I was totally amazed. It was all explained. And I decided I'm going cold turkey on the soy. This stuff just seems evil now. No more soy and I'm going to do this bone broth thing. So I went cold turkey on the soy and on that same day, I started making broth. So now I'm eating broth, no soy. Two weeks later, I got my period, and I have not missed one since. And this was wow. after 20 years of never, like basically never having a period. Like every nine months, I might have one tiny little period. Um, and uh, clockwork now, 28 days, boom, period. So there was nothing wrong with me. It was purely nutritional, purely nutritional. That it was is... so dramatic, yeah. Wow. And I didn't have a single doctor who could ever explain to me what was going on. And it was that simple. Well, that makes my blood boil, but that's a whole yeah, know, other rant know, right? for another day, right? But Yeah, and if I get cancer, I know what I'm going to blame, so yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I wouldn't want to think like that, but <laughs> but especially what you said about not menstruating and that, you know, you went to doctors and you would ask and um, yeah, I mean, did they offer you any suggestions? I could go on birth control pills. That was the only thing they could say, but I was like, that just doesn't address the issue. I'm not suffering from, quote, a lack of periods that can be, you know, like fixed by taking a pill. There's something wrong if I'm not menstruating. Can we figure out what it is? But do you think, um, I mean, thinking back to just yeah. how you, you know, because you were doing this for a reason. So oh, yeah. if someone had told you that the solution to your problem is to start eating meat, um, how do you think you would have responded at that time? Well, 
um, what I did have, the, the regular doctors never told me that, just the allopathic doctors didn't even think about it. The acupuncturists, however, because I went to a number of acupuncturists for all my problems, um, one by one, I mean, without exception, all said, you have to stop doing this. You've got to be eating some animal products. Um, and I refused to believe them. So I just flat out said, I'm not going to do it. And they basically said, I can't actually help you if you're not willing to do this. I'll try if you want to keep paying me, but it's kind of a waste of your time and money because that's your real problem. Um, and I just could not hear that at age 24 or 28 or, you know, as time progressed and I got worse, I just wasn't willing to listen because I didn't want to believe it. This had to be the right thing because it was the most righteous thing. And I really wanted God to be a just God. And that whole complete picture made so much sense to me. So I just, I wasn't going to give it up. And the only thing that also helped was that one by one, all my friends gave it up. I was really the last holdout in my friendship circle. And that includes my sister. You know, she did it for 12 years. Um, and then she started eating butter and then she started eating fish and she was, she tried to tell me, she's like, you're going to feel so much better if you would just eat fish twice a week. And I couldn't do it. Um, so I had to drive myself absolutely into the ground before I was willing, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause I, I did an interview with Alexandra James Jameson, um, about just her whole concept of follow your cravings and that mm -hmm. being okay. And, I just find it to be so interesting because it, it goes beyond a diet, uh, especially when you're bringing, I mean, it's really it, like, again, if you look at the, the, the fight on the, on my post, yeah. it goes so much further beyond diet. And the interesting thing is that even though it's, it's about diet, it's, it's, it's really just about ideal. It's more so this ideology, like this is how we're going to save the planet. And yeah. the, I guess what I feel is missing from that conversation is the shift that you have to make um, if you want to be healthy and if you want to improve your fertility. So, I mean, what I do, you know, charting your menstrual cycle and showing women how to do that and also to kind of show women how to interpret the chart so that they can mm -hmm. see how it reflects, reflects uh, on their health. And it's so clear that what you eat and how you live makes a huge difference in, in your fertility. Um, so I think what's missing from that conversation is how do you get the most nutrition? I mean, what is the most beneficial way to eat in terms of eating the most nutrient dense foods to support your whole body? So I, I don't even, it's just so interesting to hear that perspective because even someone did tell you, but you were yeah. so wrapped <laughs> up in the, you know, in the ideology that you couldn't, you just couldn't accept it. Um, so maybe you could talk just a little bit about that transition process. I mean, throughout the years, did you actually have cravings? Did you ever give in to those? And um, how did that affect you and the way that you thought about everything? I would have terrible cravings. Um, I did not crave meat. Meat to me was so, you know, it, it's, you almost develop like a, um, it's like a it becomes such a taboo, um, and I, it may, it's really made me understand people who you know do things like eat kosher, where they have these really strict religious laws, and it's unclean, you know. Like there's that whole thing about it being unclean, and it felt that way to me. Like meat was unclean, like on some really deep spiritual level. You just you couldn't engage with it in any way. I didn't even want to see it in a store. You know, it made me so upset. And you can really talk yourself into that pretty quickly. Human beings are interesting that way. Like we really can create these kinds of tremendous psychological taboos. So I can't say that I craved meat ever, but man, did I crave dairy fat um, and uh, eggs. I would crave eggs sometimes. Um, and on occasion, yes, there's, they may say, oh, I never cheat. It's a lie. All vegans cheat. Um, in fact, when they did the one study that they've done about, you know, do you cheat and how often do you cheat? You know what they cheat on? The number one thing vegans cheat on is they eat a burger and they do it once a week. <laughs> and I was horrified, even as a non-vegan at this point, reading that. I was like, I can't believe these people. They're eating a burger once a week. That's not vegan. That's like a little bit of hunger. That's not vegan. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I didn't really, the meat thing didn't, I didn't really crave it. I certainly crave it now because now I let myself. But at the time, I, it was just too repugnant. Um, but the, the dairy fat thing, yeah. And so every once in a while, you know, I would eat some. And there's always this idea when you're a vegan, you know, in sort of in vegan circles that, oh, if you eat meat or dairy, you're going to get really sick. 
and you're going to vomit and terrible things are going to happen. They sort of unnamed terrible things, just this vague, like, oh, it's going to be so awful if you slip up and do this for some bizarre reason. Why would you do that? But if you do, this is what's going to happen. And it's not true. I don't know a single person who ever got sick when they cheated. I would feel so dramatically better for hours after eating um, like sour cream or cream cheese, which was the thing that I really craved. Um, and I remember the first time I ever did it, I'd been a vegan for a bunch of years already. And my mother used to make this dip that was sour cream and cream cheese kind of blended together. And she put it on the table because there were some people coming over and I couldn't stop staring at it. I just could not stop staring at it. And now I know it was like, yeah, you were starving. Of course you couldn't stop staring at it. And then I just went and I ate it. I mean, I just sat and I ate for like an hour. I just kept eating that, that, you know, the dairy orgy. And I was like, oh no, now I'm going to feel so sick. And of course the guilt is overwhelming. Um, but I felt so much better for hours. I mean, the next day I still felt better. It's like my brain was like, thank God you gave me some fat. And I couldn't figure it out. Like, why did I feel better? I was supposed to feel terrible. I was supposed to have taught myself a lesson by doing this. And I didn't. I felt better. So then I would be like, no, you can't cheat. That was so horrible. You're such a bad person. And then, you know, a few years would go by and I wouldn't do it again. I was, I was so strict. And then the same thing would happen. I'd see a piece of pizza and I'd be like, I've got to have that cheese. I have to have that cheese. And the same thing. I would eat it and I'd feel dramatically better. I would never feel sick. Um, and then it was like, why? It was so confusing. Why don't I feel terrible? Why do I feel so much better? Um, and I, that, and then you just shove those experiences out of your brain because the cognitive dissonance is so extreme um, and it, it never made any sense. So, you know, you, then you would hear other vegans have these explanations like, well, you're just addicted to it. That's why you're craving it. It's not that you actually feel better. That's the addiction speaking. <laughs> and it's just silly. It's like, no, it's like your brain telling you you've been malnourished for five years and you finally have a little bit of fat. So, of course, you're going to feel better for 12 hours. So the, yeah, the cravings are bad. And then the sort of self-flagellation afterwards is terrible. And then just that other confusion, because none of it makes any sense. Why do I feel better when I eat this way? I'm not supposed to feel better. Um, so that just goes on. That can go on for decades because it doesn't, none of it makes any sense. Well, it's kind of like, I mean, you're just, it's kind of like you're, you're actually starving yourself, like you're eating, but you're starving yourself at the same yep. time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is what always, I mean, we're getting to, I, I feel like it's really interesting, the world that we live in now, because now, you know, everything's generally politically correct and we want to be really inclusive. And so it's not really a good idea to kind of, you know, go on a tirade against anybody who wants to do anything. I mean, you could do anything you want. If you want to be a vegan, be a vegan. Right, be you a wanna, vegan. You want to not be a vegan? Don't. Like you can, you can basically, we live in this amazing time when we have all these options, right? But one of the things I, I always wonder is, do men respond differently than women to, to the vegan diet? Because there are like men, male bodybuilders that are vegan and, and they, it's, it's, it's like they're proving to the world that, you know, no one needs to eat meat. Um, and then there's that whole vegan argument that no one eats, needs to eat meat. And we should not eat meat because that is actually going to be the thing that saves the world. And there's all these arguments around animal, you know, raising so many cows and the cows are responsible for global warming and all of this it's, stuff. Which is absurd. I mean, those, <laughs> it's just absurd. I can, we can go through that if you want, but I'm just telling everybody that is absurd. It, it, it's just, <laughs> it's so, it's just so consuming this idea yeah, know, that this is, and if everybody were to just, you know, not eat meat at least once a week, then it's like the whole world would be better. And so I'd like to get into that a little bit because um, I think that at the beginning you said, you know, the, the ideology behind it, it it's like you mean so well. You yeah. really want to help the world. You, you, I, I completely am disgusted by the factory farm system. And when it comes to your attention, it's really alarming, especially just, it's just gross, right? It, yeah. It just, yeah, it's just, and you horrible. don't want to be part of that. And yeah. it feels, and then it's, it's, it's so convenient <laughs> when you're told this by a vegan and then that is the solution right there, right. but you're so not easy. presented with any yeah. other alter <laughs> alternatives. Right. So yeah, I'd like, I'd love to get into that a little bit more. Okay, so we're start at the very beginning. We need to understand what agriculture is. So, and this is this great plant-based, you know, way of life that's supposed to save everything. This is what it is. You take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it. 
and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant it to human use. So this is biotic cleansing. I mean, you know, we've all heard of ethnic cleansing. This is biotic cleansing because you are literally removing life from that land. All the plants, all the animals have been removed. They have nowhere to go. They've been forcibly removed, which is to say they've been killed. And not just killed as individuals, but driven extinct as a species. So right now on this planet, we are losing 200 species a day. And it's because humans keep taking over more and more and more land to do agriculture mostly. Um, and that's, so that's what agriculture is. And in fact, it's the most destructive thing people have done to the planet. It is the most single destructive human activity. Okay, uh, At this point, 98% of the old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies are gone. And they've been destroyed so that we can do agriculture. Um, so there's no way that once you understand that fact, there's no way that you can say this is the food of peace or it's the food of justice or it's the food that's kind to animals because it's not. Uh, we've taken over the planet just to grow more humans. So that's one problem is mass extinction. Um, the other problem is that every time you do this activity, you're destroying the soil itself. And soil is the basis of life or the basis of land life anyway. Um, we owe our entire existence to six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. So without that soil, you know, life itself is going to come to a halt on this planet. Um, and this planet's been skinned alive at this point. By 1950, the major grain-growing regions of the world were completely played out. So at that point, what should have happened was a massive correction in the human population. And that's a terrible thing to say, but that is simply the case. Um, what, what happens, there's, there's been 34, I think, civilizations around the world. And civilization is the way of life that's based on agriculture. And what happens is, you know, you take over more and more land and you dedicate it to human use and you grow these foods, whether it's rice or corn or wheat or barley or whatever. You destroy the topsoil. Every year there's less and less soil and more and more salt and less and less water and fewer and fewer trees. And you blow through your own. And now you've, and of course, by doing that, you've let the human population grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So it kind of snowballs on you. And then you are out of food because you've destroyed the soil. And this is where imperialism comes from. So this is why civilizations end up with the same pattern. At the center, you've got this sort of bloated control center. Um, so Imperial Rome, you know, Washington, D.C., wherever it is. Um, and then they take over the neighboring countries, the neighboring lands, um, and either kill or enslave the people who live there, but they have to take the land to grow more food, to feed the ever-expanding population of that civilization. Eventually, the entire thing collapses. Until very recently in human history, um, it was limited by scale. Um, it, Rome, for instance, could only get so big. You know, Ancient India could only get so big. These kinds of massive city-states could only get so big. Um, and they can only get so big for two main reasons. One was because um, you can only transport food so far. So the hinterland couldn't be that far away if you were bringing in food back into the power center. Um, even if it was done by ship, it could still only get so far. And a lot of it was done over land. So you were stuck with, you know, when does it, you know, the kind of the, the supply train break when you're dependent on things like horses or oxen or donkeys, and it just can't get that big. Also, mountains get in the way and oceans get in the way. Um, so there's only so much you can do, you know, back in the ancient world. Civilizations can only get so big. Um, and the other problem, of course, that all of this is dependent on militarism because you've got to enslave all those people. You've got to keep them down um, somehow, and this involves weapons and it involves soldiers and all of that evil stuff. Um, but the, the chain of command could only get so long before that broke when you were dependent on, you know, people riding horses, carrying little slips of paper <laughs> or carrying, you know, even oral messages from the generals out to the hinterland that also could only get so big. Um, so they had a natural limit, ancient civilizations, you know, based on these kinds of physical limitations. Problem now is that we've got fossil fuel. So the thing has gone absolutely global because there are no limits now. Um, so that, is no longer a limitation. And then the other thing was that by 1950, I said that the, the soil was pretty much gone. That's true. And what we've been eating since then is literally fossil fuel. Um, what they figured out, uh, starting at the beginning of the 20th century and then on up, was how to take oil and gas and turn it into usable nitrogen. And this was originally for the war machine. Um, and then ultimately it got, got converted into agriculture. But by 1950, um, you've got this thing called the Green Revolution. And that is all based on massive amounts of fossil fuel being turned into nitrogen that plants can eat. And so, 
again, you've got this quadrupling of uh, agricultural output starting about then. And in response, the human population also quadruples. But the, you know, the end of this is written into the beginning because just like we used up the soil, we're going to use up that fossil fuel. You know, it doesn't reproduce. You know, we, we don't get more of it every day. Okay, we're on drawdown, and we've probably already reached the peak of, of fossil fuel. Like, it's, we're on the downside of that curve. And somewhere between, like, five and six billion people are only on this planet because of fossil fuel, because of the Green Revolution. Um, and this is not going to end well. I say this with no glee. It's going to be a very bad end. Civilizations, it's never pretty when they collapse. And this is going to be massive. And nobody wants to face what we've done as a species. And this is part of the problem. Okay? So by saying that this is somehow a solution, it's not a solution. Agriculture is the problem. These plant-based diets are literally what have wrecked the world. It doesn't matter whether you're feeding that corn to cows or feeding it directly to people. The planet cannot support it. It's an inherently destructive activity. And we have indeed trashed the planet. And this is what I did not know as a vegan. I thought that these were peaceful, you know, justice, sustainable, whatever foods, and they're not. They're the foods of utter devastation. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's really interesting to think that, uh, especially when you take a step back and think that this is the food that you're eating. I mean, crops of wheat, crops of corn, um, so, you know, crops of soy. And I mean, those are some of the most allergenic foods grown on land that doesn't have any nutrients left right um so you've touched on desertification which is a thing mm -hmm. that i don't know if everyone is you know familiar with but it's it's a huge huge problem uh agriculture turns land into deserts it's just inevitably that. it's yeah. inevitable yeah um and and maybe you could so i mean this is a pretty bleak picture so people are yes. kind of like well great now what <laughs> Now so, what do I do? <laughs> so maybe you could kind of talk a little bit about the alternative. I remember the first okay. time I heard of the idea of like permaculture and I was like, I want to live somewhere where I can have yeah. a permanent garden. And <laughs> yeah. So I think the easiest way to, to, you know, an image that people can use, I'm, I'm going to walk you through this. You've got one acre of land and there's two things that can happen on this acre of land. One is that the sort of, you know, that, first thing that I described, you clear all the life off of it. So all the plants, all the animals, really all the bacteria, all the life that teems in that soil, every year there's less and less and less of it. You know, you've cleared off the grass and the trees, you've made the animals go away, you've killed them all somehow, they're gone, there's nothing there, it's just a blank field. Now you're going to plant your corn or your wheat or whatever. And you're also destroying the water table underneath. Um, one of the, the, really the only way that water enters the soil is through the very deep roots of perennial plants, whether it's grasses or trees, they have very, very deep roots. And that literally makes channels for rain to enter the soil. And it can be absorbed into the soil like a giant sponge. And it also goes all the way down and fills up, you know, what we call the water table. Um, and so the local streams and rivers, that's how they get their water. Um, and, and so when you have no way for the rain to enter the soil, it just runs off and it destroys the surface of the soil and then it takes all that silt with it um, and, you know, water runs downhill. So it's going to find the nearest creek, the nearest river. And now all that dirt gets dumped into the local river um, and it destroys the river. Whatever's left of that river is now destroyed because, um, you know, rivers aren't meant to be clogged with dirt. They are meant to be clear so that fish can live in them. It's their homes and they can't live there anymore. They all die because of all the dirt that's in there. Um, and then the trees all die because there's not enough water left in the soil. The water table is now too far down. The tree roots can't get the water anymore. Um, so all the trees die. And what that means is not only are the trees dead, but there's no shade over the river. Fish can only reproduce at a very narrow range of temperatures. So now the water's too hot for the fish to live. You have destroyed everything, you know, in the vicinity by clearing the life off of that um, that, that piece of land. And so for some amount of time, whether it's a few decades, maybe a few hundred years, you can grow some corn. So you grow one acre of corn. And then at harvest time, you take that corn and you drive it down the road to a horrible steel building with a cement floor where a bunch of cows are living in absolute misery. And you take that acre of corn and you feed it to one cow. And that's enough for, you know, to produce one cow. And you can produce that cow. She will be miserable. She will be sick. At the end of her time, you slaughter her, you feed her to people, and 
they're just going to get sick because that meat is really unhealthy. So from beginning to end, this has been nothing but death. Okay. You've got the destroyed land, the destroyed rivers, the extinct animals, you know, the dead plants, everything's gone. The soil year by year is being depleted. Nothing left but desert at the end of that. And then you've got the misery of the factory farm. You've got that unhealthy cow and now you've got unhealthy people on top of it. And that's what you can do with one acre of corn. Okay. <laughs> Just complete misery and death. Now, same acre of land. We're going to leave it in, in pasture. We're going to leave it in some kind of grassland. It's a prairie of some sort. It is, it's got grass on it, perennial grasses. They've got really, really deep roots. Um, and they do this amazing thing. They take sunlight and carbon and they build soil. That's what grasses do. And they're amazing at it. That's like, that's their thing. You know, that's their beauty. That's this amazing thing that, that grasses do. Just sunlight and carbon out of the air and they create this abundant life. So the soil is teeming with bacteria and all kinds of microorganisms um, that do that, they keep that basic cycle of life turning. They break down nutrients and make them available again to the rest of the life community. You and I cannot do that. Without that bacteria, we are all dead. Okay, and the plants provide a home for them by making more soil. So they work together. These are symbiotic relationships. Um, because it's in permanent cover, it means that all kinds of other animals live there. You got reptiles, you get amphibians, you got ground dwelling birds, you got migrating birds, um, you got mammals, some big, some small, but all kinds. And they live there. This is their home, and they get to stay there. And every time it rains, you know, that water goes into the soil, um, keeps life going, fills up the water table, and those deep rooted perennials working with bacteria, actually break up rock. That's one of the things they eat. They can get those minerals from way down and they bring them up through their roots and they make them available to the rest of us. You and I cannot eat rock. We cannot get minerals on our own. <laughs> we are dependent on ultimately on those plants and that bacteria to get those minerals out of the ground and into the cycle of life for us. And that's what they do. Those perennial, perennial plants do that. Um, annuals do not have Deep, deep roots like that. They can't. Corn can't do that. Wheat can't do that. But perennial grasses and trees can do that. And they do. So you've got this acre of land and it is teeming with life. Okay. And one of the beings on that acre of grass is a ruminant. Um, without ruminants, grasslands will degrade to desert. You cannot have a functioning grassland without a ruminant. What do ruminants do? Well, they carry around inside them. They have four stomachs for these rumens. Um, and they, uh, they can actually digest grass. Um, and the interesting thing is they're not actually doing the work. What they're doing is, yes, they bite it and they swallow it, but who's actually digesting it is the bacteria inside them. So they're actually providing habitat for these amazing bacteria that know how to digest cellulose. And it's a fermentative process. You and I don't have stomachs that do that. We have acid-based digestion. But they have these very neutral stomachs that provide a home for bacteria, and the bacteria are what break down the cellulose in the grass. Um, so a cow is actually trading in really poor quality food, which is that cellulose, that grass. And by swallowing it and giving it to the bacteria, she's feeding the bacteria. At the end of the day, what she actually eats is the bacteria, which are high fat and high protein. So she's trading in this poor nutrient stuff uh, for very high nutrient food. Um, but in the meantime, of course, that cellulose gets degraded. Um, she eats the bacteria. Some of them get pooped out the other end, and you've got... Um, an incredible amount of fertility coming out of that cow that keeps the nutrient cycle moving. What happens in a grassland, um, the reason they're not forests is because there's not as much water. So forests are wetter generally, grasslands are drier, and grasses are the people that can survive in those kinds of drier, what we call brittle environments. But during especially the summer when there's no rain, the only life that is uh, making that nutrient cycle continue is actually the bacteria inside a ruminant. Um, Without that bacteria doing that work, the nutrient cycles stop, and again, it degrades to desert. So the action of ruminants is crucial to the life of um, a grassland or a prairie. Um, and this is what a lot of us don't understand. You can't take out a species you know, from those complex relationships and have a living community at the end of it. Um, you can't remove the ruminants. So the ruminants and the grasses work together, and they each make more of each other. In the act of eating and then in the act of dying, they produce more. And you could come back in 10,000 years to that same acre of, of grass, and the only difference would be, I don't know, another 10 feet of topsoil. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else would still be intact. There would be more life. It would be more abundant, uh, you know, more resilient, more lush with life. 
And at the end of that same year, now in the one scenario, we had the corn and we had nothing but death and destruction all the way. Now you've got a system, you have a living community that provides for itself, that makes more of itself. And yes, there is a ruminant. And yes, a human can now eat that ruminant. And the human is healthy as well. It's perfect food for humans. It matches the nutritional needs of us perfectly because this is what we evolved eating, right? We evolved on the African savanna. It was those large ruminants who made us human. Um, this is the food we've been eating for probably two and a half million years. So, of course, it's perfect for food for humans. And the part that, the, that I did not understand as a vegan was that I die too. The human in that scenario dies as well. And when she dies, her body is also taken up into that soil, into that grass, becomes part of that life cycle as well. None of us are immune. We all eat and then we all get eaten. And that's it. That's, you either see that that's beautiful or you find horror in it and you try to escape from it. And I decided to embrace that, that my life was only possible because of death. But I would die too. And I would play my part when the time came, you know, and that the grass will eat me, the birds will eat me, somebody will eat this body. You know, we're, we're all just members of this tribe called carbon and we're all just taking turns. And I, breaking that cycle is that first scenario. And that's the foods of agriculture. And I thought as a vegan, those were the foods of peace and they're not, they're the foods of death and destruction. I didn't want to believe that. You know, I looked down at my plate and all I could ask was, is there something dead on this plate? And it's a much bigger question because the real question is what died to get that food on your plate? And if you're eating corn or wheat or soy, I mean, the answer is entire continents, 200 (laughs) species every day. You know, that's what agriculture is. And I didn't know that when I was a vegan. And it was so hard coming to grips with this all emotionally, but you have to do it to be a grown up. You know, there's, there's the basic algebra of embodiment. You know, we have to be grateful for everything that dies to feed us. There's no way out of this. You know, Mm -hmm. once you take birth, then, then this is what it means to be alive. Your body needs nutrients. And no matter what you're eating, somebody died to feed you. So be grateful, be humble, and, you know, walk with as much grace as you can. But you've got to accept that there's death involved. Well, you know, I, there's something that you talked about in your book that I want to ask you about before we wrap up today. And it was just your description of your experience farming. <laughs> I had to chuckle as I was reading that because, you know, I have a tiny little garden in, in the back and, you know, your your wars with the slugs. Like I was right there with you. Yeah. Those slugs. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I think it's so interesting because as soon as you start gardening, you realize like there's yes. more to this than I thought. I know I need a chicken to deal with my slugs, but I can't have one because I live in the city. But anyways, I would just, um, I think that that's a really great place to kind of bring our discussion to, because I think what's missing too from the vegan ideology is, is how, if you look back traditionally at our ancestors, we didn't live in isolation either. And I think that the picture that you just painted really illustrates that we, as a race of, of people always lived along with animals. Right. We always did. It was always, if you if you really think about it, and it's really been brought home to me recently, uh, because I um, I do get my milk now from a farm. Yay! Uh, raw milk, and yeah. so then I have to actually go to the farm, and I uh-huh. you know bring my kids, and yep, yep, and you just really get a sense mm-hmm. that um, if there was something that happened and the entire world went kaput. If you had a little piece of land and some cows and some chickens, you'd be okay. You'd be all right. Yep. Yeah. Well, and Chernobyl actually stands in as an example of this because, you know, they cleared everybody out of that area, you know, when that whole thing went down, except there were some people who refused to leave. And almost entirely the people who refused to leave were the old women. They're like, I'm not leaving my land. I'm not leaving my farm. This is the land of my ancestors. You can't make me move. I don't care if I die of radiation poisoning. So be it. I'm not leaving. And some of them are still there. And there's pictures of them. You can go online and see them. And they're like 80 years old and they've got their goats and their chickens and they're eating their homemade yogurt. And their kefir and, you know, their sour, their beet kvass and these traditional Russian foods. And they're still alive. The radiation didn't kill them. And they're perfectly happy on their little farms. Like they know how life works um, and more power to them as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but it's just so great to see their old, you know, and some of them, they've, some of their families have even returned as well. They're not allowed to, but they sneak back on. So, um, yeah, it's like 
the end of the world came and, and the old women were like, I'm not budging. So I have a great deal of respect for that. Um, yes, the slugs. So here I was trying to be a vegan and I know you're supposed to grow your own food, try to close the loop as much as possible. You know, you start to do the food miles on a head of lettuce and it's insane that we ship lettuce 2000 miles across the country. I will learn to garden and I loved gardening and it really gave me a lot of a lot of hope and a lot of joy at times in my life when I was very depressed and it just it's a very it's a it's just a very life affirming thing you know to grow things so I did I got my hands in the soil and I quickly learned that um you can't garden as a vegan first of all the soil requires dead things it wants <laughs> bone meal and it wants blood meal and it wants manure and it wants all kinds of animal products because that's what soil is it's dead plants and dead animals and you can't as a person as a human being insist that you're going to do it this other way um, that doesn't involve animals because that's not what the soil wants. That's not what soil is made from. So you can try to remove those things, but you'll end up with soil that's so depleted that there's no point in growing anything on it. So that was driven home to me pretty quickly just from reading and then experimenting like, yeah, the soil's exhausted pretty quickly. So I threw some manure on it and what do you know? I had great food. Um, but you know, it's a huge compromise because well, somebody had to keep those goats. Well, I'm not going to keep the goats. I'm going to be good and pure. But, you know, you're making a compromise because somebody somewhere had a barn full of goats and I went and got the manure. So there's that. And then, of course, is the endless problem with the other animals that also want to live on that land and also want to eat. And this starts with little tiny things like, you know, hornworms and whatnot, and it moves up to slugs. And then ultimately you get the rabbits and the groundhog and the deer and they all want to eat your garden. And you're faced with these terrible dilemmas about what does it mean? Because we all can't eat that food. And if I want it, they can't have it. So night after night, I had a battle with the slugs because, of course, they love nothing more than a tender <laughs> little start of lettuce. So I must have replanted the lettuce, I don't know, six times, seven times one summer. They just kept eating it every night. And then I would try again and then they would eat it. And I couldn't bring myself to kill them because I was a vegan and this was going to be the peaceful, wonderful, magical food that nothing died to produce. So I couldn't kill them. But, of course, they were eating my food. So then I would try again, and they would eat it again. And I couldn't talk to them. I tried. <laughs> I heard these great, you know, groovy stories about people singing and doing rituals and begging and praying. And I tried all that. Nothing worked. They were hungry. They ate the lettuce. You know, like, that's what slugs do. So then I thought, well, I'll use the beer traps. You know, like, they, you know, they love the smell of beer. And then they drink a little bit, and they get really drunk, and they fall in, and they drown. And it's a very effective, non-toxic way to kill slugs. Um, and they'd probably die happy because they're drunk. I assume they're having a good time. I don't know. I'm not a slug, but I would assume so. So I put out the beer traps, and then I woke up at 2 in the morning, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't do it. I can't kill the slugs. So I ran outside. I poured out the beer traps. I saved the slugs. And, of course, they ate all my lettuce once more. <laughs> so I was like, all right, one more time. What am I going to do? So the next night I went out, and I collected all the slugs. So I had this pile of slugs. What do you do with them? I mean, where do you put them then? I was like, is there, like, a farm slug sanctuary? There's, like farm sanctuaries for all kinds of animals. Is there a place where we send slugs? Of course there isn't. But why can't there be one? What am I supposed to do with these slugs? And I was living in a pretty rural environment. So I went down to where there was, you know, like the nearest little stretch of woods. And I thought, well, I'll just let them go. I'll just let them free range here. So I let them out and, you know, slugs move really slowly. And watching them move, I really had time to think. And I realized, you know, if there was room here for more slugs, they would already be here. And I'm dumping these slugs out here. I've moved them from their home. I'm putting them here where there are clearly already enough slugs. And what's going to happen is some of these slugs are just going to die of starvation. It'll either be these slugs or the slugs that they displace. But some number of slugs is going to die because I'm doing this. And I'm fooling myself to think otherwise. So I gave up at that point. It's like, I can't. I just can't do it. I'm not cut out for this. I can't kill anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a vegan. I, can't, I don't do this. So I went to the store. I was like, ah, oh, I'm so relieved. I'm just going to buy a head of lettuce. And I was so happy for one second. And I held that head of lettuce. And it's like, you can face this or not. This is the moment. What are you going to do? And I decided I had to grow up. And I remember picking up that lettuce and thinking, you've got to stop fooling yourself. If this lettuce is worth eating, it means somebody somewhere killed slugs so you could have this food. They killed a whole bunch of stuff so you could have this food. There is no way. <laughs> if that soil is healthy enough that it grew lettuce worth eating, there are animals that want to eat it, whether it's deer or rabbits or slugs or whoever. Somebody somewhere did that work for you, and you can pay $2 and buy this lettuce and pretend that your hands are clean because this is vegan food and it didn't have a face or a mother. But I can tell you, having tried this, 
somebody killed those slugs. So you can pay it off and pretend it didn't happen, or you can face the fact that slugs had to die for you to eat. And that's actually what I had to do. I had to just face that it was a beautiful ideal, but it doesn't work in the, in, in the here and now. That's not actually how life happens. Um, and it was a terrible moment, but it was also a good moment because it's better to face these things. Be- like I said before, our only option is to do it well. You know, mm-hmm. you have to face it. And then you can, then you can do it well. Then you can say, all right, what is the food that builds topsoil? What is the, actually the food that builds justice? What is actually the food where animals can have their homes and the rivers are restored? And we actually can se- sequester carbon. It's the only hope we have is, is to um, repair those, those grasslands. That's the only hope we have at this point to stop global warming. The grasses can still do this, but they need their ruminant friends. They need their ruminant cohort. So we need to understand that cycle of life, and we need to understand what agriculture has done. And being a vegan did not help me do that. Well, you know, after our discussion today, what is one thing that you want the listeners to take from it after everything we've talked about? I want them to, I want them to know that they don't have to change the nature of who they are but they can make different decisions with better knowledge. So you can still be somebody who, you know, with all your heart, you want to save this planet. You want to care about animals. You want to care about the earth. You want to care about human rights. Those are the right values to have, but you can make a different decision based on a fuller knowledge of how this planet actually works as a whole. Um, And you'll still be the same person at the end of that. It is hard to change your mind about things, but don't let yourself rigidify into a fundamentalist mindset because that doesn't help anyone. Mm-hmm. And if there's one myth or what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you'd like to see corrected? Um, uh, yeah, I don't eat soy. <laughs> just like, don't go near soy. The number one thing, do not touch soy. Like just stop eating it. If you're eating it, <laughs> Spit and then it out figure right out now. all the things that we already know about how bad it is, but it will destroy you. It'll destroy your thyroid. It'll destroy your uterus. It'll destroy your ovaries. It'll destroy your joints. It'll destroy your memory. It'll destroy your digestive system. Like there's not a thing that soy is not going to destroy. Yeah. Yeah. No. And yeah, it's, it's just tipping <laughs> that it's just really, I should do a whole, so uh, a whole show on soy to be honest. Yeah, it's just like, you should tipping um the iceberg there and the last question i want to ask you is i want to hear about the arrest thing <laughs> well, i've done civil, civil disobedience a bunch of times when i was younger and i couldn't my spine's too bad now i really can't go back to that but um yeah when i was younger and had a little more bounce in my body um i've been arrested uh, doing feminist actions against male violence i've been arrested doing um getting arrested at military bases uh, protesting imperialism and racist violence around the world and nuclear weapons and that kind of stuff and um it's actually a lot of fun getting arrested it's really scary Um, but we can do it as a group and you're all together there for a good reason. And you, sometimes it's the only thing you can do, you know, as a citizen of the world, it feels like I've got to throw myself into this machine to make this stop. Um, so, you know, you got to do what you can do and it's not for everyone and not everybody can take those kinds of risks. Um, but if you can, I, civil disobedience is a very elegant political tactic and when it's done appropriately, it has changed the world. It has, there are regimes around the world that have been brought down just by citizens rising up in, in amazing, courageous ways. And Jean Sharp is the writer who is really the historian and the theorist of nonviolent direct action. And I cannot recommend his books highly enough. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Lear, thank you so much for being here today. I really get, I think we all, um, all the listeners, we really get a sense of your passion um, for the world, right? All of the different issues, all of the, the things that we need to be focused on. And some of the things that we don't really, I mean, if you just kind of watch TV and just kind of get lost in the media circus, you kind of forget about what's really important. And so I really appreciate you for being here today and sharing your passion um, for making the world just a better place and educating. And what you said about it being a cautionary tale, I think it's really important to have a balanced perspective. So, you know, for all of the, the vegan rhetoric out there, you know, you need to hear another side of the story so that you can make an informed decision of what's going to be best for you and not just ideologically, literally best for yeah. you and your, your body. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us today. Well, I want to thank you for all your work because if it wasn't for people like you 
helping to get the word out, there'd be no point in being a person like me who <laughs> writes about these ideas. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And maybe you could take a moment to tell the listeners where they can find you and your work and sure. your books and everything. So uh, I like to say, oh, it's really easy. You just go to my website. And that's a joke because my website is learkeith.com, which means you need to know how to spell my name. Um, so it's L-I-E-R-R-E-K-E-I-T-H. Easier if you can't remember that. If you just type in vegetarian myth, I am the only person who has written a book with that title. So if you just type in vegetarian myth, you will find my book and you will find a lot of evil shit about me, which you don't have to believe. <laughs> Can if you want to. I don't actually care. The Internet is a wild place. But vegetarian myth, you will find my book and you will find my website. And if you are interested in these ideas, you will find out a whole bunch more. So. All right. Well, thank you again, Lear. It was my pleasure chatting with you today. We had such a great conversation. I'm really excited to share it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 94. I really enjoyed my conversation with Lear in our episode today. I really appreciated how honestly and openly she shared her own story. And I was so struck by her story and how her diet and her dietary choices impacted her health so significantly. And I was also struck just by her determination. It takes a lot of will and determination to stick to a vegan diet for 20 years. And although I know that, you know, some people do better on those types of diets than others, I think especially when you're thinking in terms of, you know, what's the best way to eat for fertility? How should I be eating when I'm in those years when I'm thinking about getting pregnant and having baby and I appreciated how she shared her experience with menstruation and how you know her diet significantly impacted her her period to the point that she didn't have a period for almost 20 years or she had very sporadic periods I should say for the whole period of time that uh, that she was vegan and I think what I was also struck by was that even though you, you know it's kind of like you want to say, oh, I wish someone had told me, but someone did tell her. And because of her ideology and her belief system, she just wasn't ready to, to hear it. What I also appreciated about this conversation was her perspective and the perspective about agriculture and just really delving into, you know, that idea that veganism and vegetarianism are the things that are going to make the world a better place. Because I think that it's such a nice idea to think that all you have to do is stop eating meat and somehow you're going to make the world a better place. It's just so simple. It's so neatly tied up in a little bow and fairly kind of, it just makes the world pretty black and white. You know, like if meat is the problem, then you just stop eating it and everything's great. And so I like that Lier really puts a wrench in that logic and really delves into, you know, what really is agriculture and where does our food really come from and what needs to happen in order for our world to be healthy what needs to happen for our soil to be healthy and really looking at where our food is coming from so I think there's so many things that we can do to really get back to that idea and to find kind of go back to those traditional ancestral roots I think it's really important not to be too detached from where our food does come from and I would encourage all of you listening to to really think about that you know where is my food coming from the next time you're in the supermarket take a look at the food that you're eating usually the food is marked of where it came from so just think about how many miles or thousands of miles <laughs> the food that you're eating came from and when you're able to to really try to eat locally you know look up your local farmers market and support some of your local farmers Find, you know, a farm where you can get some meat, right? There's lots of different options. You know, I'm in Canada and there's lots of different options. There's a CSA where you can kind of go in with a few people and, um, you know, get your meat together. I know lots of my friends have gone in together to buy a cow. And like I mentioned on, on the show, you know, my experience buying milk from the farm, it really connects me to my community. It's really interesting to know that, you know, when I buy milk from the farm, I'm actually supporting a family and I know who they are and I, I go to their farm and it really kind of prevents you from, from being so detached and not really knowing where your food comes from. 
and just a, a natural result of shopping locally, trying to get, trying to source your meat, you know, from local farmers and your vegetables and, and growing your own, a natural result of that is that the food that comes from, you know, closer to where you are, it actually is more nutrient dense typically, and it doesn't have to travel a thousand miles. Those are some of my thoughts that I wanted to share with you today. And just really to take that from the conversation as well. You know, what can I do to support my local environment? And although it might not be possible for, for all of us to do that, especially all the time, maybe once in a while, you can stop by your local farmer's market, see if you can source some meat and some vegetables locally, and maybe even grow something. Even if you live in an apartment building, maybe you could grab you know, a pot from the store, fill it with some dirt and grow some herbs, grow some thyme and oregano and season your, your food with it. So yes, if you've been enjoying the podcast, please do look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. And also, if you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, send me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. So I want to thank you once again for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast, whether you're on the go or whether you're walking the dog or commuting to work or whatever you're doing today. Thanks again. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.